So how to deal with a negative person? You know, sometimes um, we can feel like negativity is all around us. But thank God we have the power within us to overcome any negativity around us. Is, is that right? Does the Bible say greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world? Or is that just something we say just, to, just because it's easy to remember or something, you know? No, we, we believe it, right? Yeah. It is the truth. And so negative people tend to focus on other people's faults. They point out shortcomings with their comments, attitudes, and frowns. Sometimes they don't have to say a word. You can just see it on their face. Amen? Negative people will approach situations from a pessimistic viewpoint, assuming the worst in any given situation. Sometimes negative people disguise their negativity by using humor or sarcasm, but it still ultimately results in someone feeling put down. Negativity can show up at the most precious and memorable moments of life. I think sometimes that's when it's the hardest to, to handle when negativity comes in at a, at a moment that's, that's special to you. And uh, maybe people don't appreciate the moment, appreciate the value of, of something that, like you do. And uh, we're going to read in John chapter 12. We're we'll reading out of the New King James Version. You can see what Jesus, Jesus um, did when that happened. The Bible is a very interesting historical book. We can see that Jesus faced the same things we face. And if we can see how he handles situations, we can learn also. He should be our teacher. He should be our, our example. And so negativity can show up at the most precious and memorable moments of life. It's important that we don't allow the negativity to um, diminish the special moment either. Negativity can show up in, in the church. And that's why uh, I preach to myself because I love this church. And I love what we do. And so I have to be careful not to let the negativity diminish the special thing that we have here. Amen. Amen. It could show up at the workplace. It could show up in the home. It could show up anywhere. But God's given us wisdom. He's given us strength to overcome negative people and negative circumstances. So look at John 12. Verse 1 says, Then six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany, where Lazarus, who had been dead, whom he had raised from, from the dead. Lazarus was there. Verse 2, There they made him a supper, and Martha served. But Lazarus was one of those who sat at the table with him. Then Mary took a pound of very costly oil of spikenard, anointed the feet of Jesus, wiped his feet with her hair, and the house was filled with the fragrance of oil. But one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, who would betray him, said, Why was this fragrant oil not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? This he said, not that he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief and had the money box, and he used to take what was put in it. But Jesus said, let her alone. She has kept this for the day of my burial. For the poor you have with you always, but me you do not have always. So we're going to revisit this, this story here in a minute. But I want to say this before we do. Be careful how you respond when, how you respond when you're faced with a negative person. Be careful. It's not your emotions that are the problem. Human beings are emotional beings. You're going to cry. You're going to laugh. You're going to feel disappointed. I hope that's not like a busting anybody's faith bubble. That's just life. 
When you become a Christian, you don't become a robot. You're a human being that still has emotions, but you learn how to deal with the emotions. It's not the emotions that are the problems, it's how we deal with them that can be the problems. Doesn't the Bible say be angry and sin not? That's right. How many people do you think there are that they think if they get angry, they've sinned? No, you didn't. Depends on what you let it come out of your mouth. Then you might, <laughs> right? But anger comes, anger goes. The Bible clearly says you can be angry and sin not. You can be disappointed and sin not. You can be all sorts of things. You know the Bible says that God resists the proud and gives grace to the humble. This verse is one of my, my staple verses because... If you think about it, God does resist people. He resists the, the people that are full of pride. I don't want him resisting me. But then it says that he gives grace to the humble. Now I want to say something. When I say God resists the proud, because I feel like the Holy Spirit wants me to say this, probably not for anyone in here, but maybe for someone listening later, that if God resists the proud, it does not mean that he, he, he stops loving someone. It has nothing to do with his love for them. But there's, there's God's way and then there's every other way. And you can put it this way. God cannot do anything with someone who's in pride. Because that's a heart issue. And we need to yield our heart to him. And I'm conscientious of that fact. And I remind myself of that all the time. That's why I try to be humble. I just I try, try to be humble. A few times, if, if I get out of that humility, the Holy Spirit quickly puts me back in there. Or he reminds me. He doesn't beat me down or chain me up. He just puts a little tweak in my heart and, and says, that's not who I called you to be. And that's not how this ship's going to sail over there as the pastor. You're not going to be like that. And I say, yes, sir. Right? I want to be on the same page as him. I don't want to be out doing my own thing. I mean, we're all in the same box, I believe, sometimes. And so, but I, I want the grace of God that comes to the humble. So how do we usually lift ourselves up in pride? With your mouth, with your words. That's why the Bible says, be angry and sin not. Don't let it fly. Keep it in. Keep those words caged in and and. Allow the Holy Spirit to, to um, work on you a little bit. Your first words are important. Some, some years ago, Leslie went to see Kenneth Copeland, and he said, when sudden fear comes, your first words are important words. What are you going to say when sudden fear comes? You better be speaking the word. Go ahead and put up the shield and get the, get the um, wall mounted uh, of the word of God. But what are you gonna, what's your first words when you're angry? They're important too. Right? Even if it's just give me a minute and let me, let me have a little minute to myself. They're good first words. If you, if you say you low down, no good for nothing, then that's bad words, right? And it's not gonna do anybody any good. And uh, you're human, and even though you're good Christians, I'm sure maybe you're tempted sometimes to, to um, speak like that. So fear, anger, disappointment, even sadness. Your words. The Bible says we're to yield our words or our tongue to the Holy Spirit. James said no man can tame the tongue, but the Holy Spirit can. Right. Amen. And he can help us in every area of that. In James chapter 1, don't turn there for time's sake, but it's James chapter 1 verse 19 if you want to look at it later. It gives a little bit of a, of a, of a method here. It says, be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to get angry. I think sometimes a lot of people, they do it backwards. They get angry real fast, they speak even faster, and they never listen. So be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to get angry. The Amplified Bible says it like this. Be a careful and thoughtful listener. 
If people know you're listening to them, even the difficult people you might be dealing with, it's going to help in the whole process. Because people like to know that, you're, that they're at least being listened to. So be a careful, thoughtful listener. And then it says, have carefully chosen words. Carefully chosen words is what you're to speak into every situation. Carefully chosen words. Who chooses those words for you? Well, the Holy Spirit will choose them for you. And what's he going to give you the guidelines for those carefully chosen words? Right here. The Word of God. Amen. If the Bible says don't repay evil for evil, then don't repay evil for evil. And how are you going to repay evil for evil? Usually with your words. And so, carefully chosen words after you've listened very carefully. And then it says be patient, reflective, and, and forgiving. We have to be a forgiving people, don't we? When it comes to dealing with negative people, keep it in the middle of the road, not in the ditch. Keep, that's for every subject. Keep it down the middle of the road. People like to get into ditches. One ditch might be on this side, well, I'm never going to say anything to the negativity that's around me. I'm never going to say anything to this negative person. Now, that's in the ditch because sometimes you need to say something. This message is, isn't about never say anything. <laughs> Now, this is a message about choose your words wisely. And then the other side of the ditch, someone will say, boy, if they come at you, you come at them harder. That's what the president does, but we're not, we're not, we're not we'll pray for him. <laughs> but, you know, if they come at me, I'm, I'm going to come at them harder. You're way over on the ditch on this side. That's rarely the answer, isn't it? Rarely the answer. So how did Jesus answer Judas? He answered him with humility, didn't he? I want to look at what he said here. He didn't get personal, did he? He didn't say, Judas, you big loser. <laughs> I know you're stealing money anyway. You know, he just kept it on point. This was a good moment. This moment that Judas interrupted with his negativity was a moment that we're still reading about 2,000 years later. Lazarus was in the room, the, the, the man that Jesus rose from the dead. He's sitting at the table. And Mary breaks that spikenard oil. The, the, the amount that, of money that that cost was enough for one year's wage. Very, very expensive oil, perfume. The whole house filled up with it. It was like, Probably, probably smelled like roses or something. It was just like, oh, what a moment. And she wiped his hair, Jesus' hair, with her, his feet with her hair. Oh, come on. What a moment. And then Judas decided to speak. But the way Jesus handled him, he did not allow Judas to lessen the significance of the moment. It was still a special moment. We tell people all the time, a lot of times when people are getting married, sometimes the in-laws get involved. And they fight. Who gets to do what? So who cares who gets to do what? And, and, but we always tell them, don't let them, don't let them ruin your moment. Some, some people don't care. They think it's about them. No, it's about this young couple that's getting married. Married. It's not about whether or not you can buy the flowers or decorate some hall somewhere. But I digress. But Jesus kept the moment special, didn't he? Do you think if he would have directed Judas in a negative way, in a condescending way, or in a personal way, that whole moment would have been blown up? Wouldn't it? If, if you answer people in a negative way, personal, angry way, what you do is take the spotlight off of what they have said to you and you put it on yourself now. And now the only thing anybody ever cares about is, is how you responded. And then they'll use it against you. They'll go all around town telling everybody how you yelled at them and what you said. 
And they won't leave out their part. They'll leave out their part. That's just how it is. We, we ought not get to that place in our life, should we? Look at, look at this. Look at verse 5 again. He says, why was this fragrant oil not sold for 300 denarii? Judas said this, and given to the poor. This he said, not that he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief and had the money box. And he used to take what was put in it. But Jesus said, let her alone. She has kept this for the day of my burial. For the poor you have with you always, but me you do not have always. He handled that pretty nice, didn't he? I don't think Jesus abided by the theory, well, you just let people be negative all they want, and, and you never have to. Sometimes you need to speak out. Amen? But he didn't, he didn't um, get over into anger. If Jesus would have said, Judas, you, you are a low-down, miserable soul. You're a terrible person. He'd have sinned. And he never sinned. People sin 90% of the time with their mouths. And it's the least thing they consider. They'll just talk whatever put... The Bible says only a fool will say what comes into your, their mind. You gotta, you gotta analyze every thought that comes in that noggin. You gotta, you gotta analyze it. The Bible says take every thought captivity, right? And the bad thoughts that want to lead to words, the Bible says cast down those thoughts and imaginations. You're responsible for your words. You're responsible and accountable for every other word. It doesn't matter what prompted you to say it. You're responsible for your own words. And people say, well, they made me angry. How did they make you angry? They gave you an opportunity maybe to get angry. But how they make you angry? Do, they, do you have a button on you they can just, or, or, I mean, they can't make you angry. Only you can decide if the anger is going to, you know, what they said could have brought some anger in there, but you don't have to act on it. I think sometimes we give people too much power over our lives. And sometimes when people know that they can push those types of buttons, they could be good people, but it's sort of like a power trip with them. And they know that they can yield a power over you because they can say things or do certain things, and they know that they'll get a response. You need to take that kind of power away from whoever it is that's doing that. Amen? Because it'll lead you into not good, good places. But Jesus, being the all-patient one that he is, spoke to him with respect, didn't he? He gave him a rebuke. I know people don't like that word because it sounds like puke or something. <laughs> you know, rebuke sounds like you got to punch somebody in the face or something. Or, or yell at them or scream at them until they cry. All a rebuke is, stop. That's not right. Please don't do it again. Was that a rebuke when he said, let her alone? Let her alone. Sometimes we're called to be a defender of the weak. And sometimes we might need to step in. If we see someone being under the, being hurt by negativity or something. We might need to step in and, and give a, a rebuke like that. It's not a bad word, is it? You know, in the church, we have to keep our church sacred. We have to keep our perspective of the church holy. And I wasn't planning on saying that, but the Holy Spirit just put it right in my mouth. Holy. What's holy mean? We're separate. Separated to who? God. We're not the moose club. Nothing against the moose. Just don't go there. Oh, no. We're not any other club. We're the body of Jesus Christ. Amen. We're the ecclesia. 
We're the governing authority on planet earth for the kingdom of heaven. All power in heaven and earth has been given unto us to bind and to loose, not to curse people with our words. I use this example. Someone could have like a very beautiful multi-million dollar home. I mean, it's the most magnificent home you could think of. A nice rose garden, a nice pool in the backyard. And they can go down in the basement and look, at, look, look around in the basement and see one little crack in the concrete in the basement. And they could stand down there and look at that crack, that crack in the, in the basement and miss out on the beauty of the home. Leave the crack alone. It's not going to hurt anybody. <laughs> right? Get on up there and get your swim trunks on and get in the pool. Or go do some gardening and plant your favorite flowers. Don't look, don't, don't care about the crack in the basement. But that's what people do in churches. They, 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 they find the little cracks and the little flaws. Well, yeah, don't look too hard because you might find it in yourself too. I don't know. You may find it in me. Probably will. If you look, if you want to, you want to direct all your energy towards that. I'd rather look at the beauty of of us. Amen. I'd rather look at where we came from. All of us are a testimony, a, a beautiful testimony. Amen. Any given Sunday, I can look out there. You know what I see? And even in this evening, I see miracles. I see lives that were at one time on the verge of destruction, now healthy and whole. Any given Sunday, I can look out in that congregation and see at least three people or more that at one time tried to take their own life, and now they're serving God. I can see marriages that are put back together again that were out the door, one foot out the door, suitcases packed, and now they're together, and that's good because the little kids need their mommy and daddy. I mean, I see the people that were on drugs and alcohol trying to fill voids, and now I see them c um, coming in and, and not being drunk with wine, but being filled with the Spirit of God. I mean, I see them. So I'm not going to look at the crack and the flaws. I'm going to look at the beauty of us because that's special. You are a special people. Amen. We are a special people because God loves us all, doesn't he? Amen. Be careful not to view all criticism as negative. There is such a thing as constructive criticism, isn't there? In Proverbs 12, it says, whoever loves discipline loves knowledge. He who hates correction is stupid. Yeah. That's what it says. That translates. I think the King James says brutish. Brutish, B-R-U-T-I-S-H, brutish. But we don't know that word, so stupid. Right? I don't want to be stupid. And it's talking spiritually. Right? You could be the smartest natural person in the world, but be not too smart spiritually. And if you don't, like correction, then you're stupid. I'm just saying what the Bible says. I'm just saying it. Right? There is constructive criticism. Now let me get over into how we can make sure that we're not the person of negativity. Sometimes we can be the negative one, can't we? It's, it's important that we learn not to... Um, be negative because you could have well-meaning, well-needed advice, but if, you, if you're usually giving it in a negative way, it's not going to be received. Nobody wants to hear from you anymore because you've already messed everything up because not anybody in here, I'm just saying a person, right? They get tired of you. And as soon as you open their mouth, they're like, what now? And you have the best advice in the world. You could save them a million dollars or something. They don't want to hear it. We got to preserve our relationships with people. Because the whole idea is helping others. On our way to heaven, 
God wants us to help others. Amen? If you want to help him, help others. That's what he needs you to do. And then we need to, to learn to pick and choose our battles. You don't have to fight every battle. Sometimes it's just refreshing to say, Lord, you take that one. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be humble because I know you give grace to the humble. Because if I speak, I'm, gonna, I'm probably going to sin. And I'm going to get angry. You know you shouldn't say, how many, how many of you have said words that you knew you shouldn't have said them? I'm not the only one then. I'm glad for that. How many of you have ever blown past the stop sign inside knowing, no, don't say that, don't say it, but you just had to say it anyway? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I've been there. I've been there many a times. One time, you know, I'm, I'm pretty good at, I'm good in the church. It's usually people are pretty good in the church. I'm talking more like now your home, where you lay down, you just relax a little bit. But well, they're the ones that we should be treating the best in your home. I remember one day, um, back way back when, when we used to greet people going out the door, but we stopped doing that on Sunday morning because it made a big bottleneck, and people wanted to get home, and uh, so we, that's why we don't stand back at the door anymore. And uh, then they felt obligated to shake our hands, and if they had to get out of line, they, they felt bad, so I'm not putting anybody in that position anymore. <laughs> but... Um, Someone came through the line. They're not in the church anymore. They were just like checking us out. But they never took up roots or anything. And uh, they, say, they said something very offensive, very dumb. And it bothered me because everybody was around could hear it. About 10 people. And uh, I just smiled. But inside, I had some comebacks. And they were epic. They were the shut down, mic dropping kind. And the Holy Spirit's like, don't say it, don't say it, don't say it, don't say it. And you know why he didn't want me to say it? Because all the people around would have had to hear it. Hear it. They would have had to hear a pastor get smart with someone. And I might have felt good for me, but it wouldn't have done anybody else any good. And then, and then people might have ran out, ran out and said, pastor, they wouldn't have told the whole story. Don't get me started. <laughs> but I went home that day, and I went into my house, and I said, oh, thank you that I didn't say that. Thank you. I took a deep breath. Because if I would have said what I was thinking about saying, it would have tore me up inside. Because that's not what God put me here to do. He did not put me here to have good comebacks and to drop mics or whatever you do. <laughs> He put me here to be loving, and to be kind, and to be patient. Amen? Amen? And I have no problem with that because that's my general nature. It's just that we're all human. And we all can get stung by the anger bug or, or something, <laughs> you know. And, uh, but we can pick and choose our battles. Here's another good one. This is how you can avoid being a negative person. Watch your tone. Watch your tone with people. Sometimes it isn't what you say, it's how you say it. We've got to watch that. And don't use words like you always or never. There are no good words in an argument. You always do this. You never do that. You just cut the lines of communication down. And you need the lines of communication up. You just went over into the ditch. You just got unreasonable. Don't tell someone they always and never. Because nobody likes to hear that. There's better ways to, to express yourself. You need the lines of communication up in your marriage and in your church and even at the workplace. Because no communication brings resentment. And, in no, and resentment brings bitterness. Do you ever, if you're bitter, 
You can't be happy. They don't go together. Did you ever hear someone say, there goes that happy, bitter person? Don't work, does it? You're either one or the other. And then if you're bitter too long, then you get a stronghold in the mind. The devil puts it there. You know what a stronghold is? Like a fortress, like a bunker, like a, just a, uh, uh, your mind is just overwhelmed and possessed by anger or bitterness or, or offense. You better hope you don't get a spirit of offense. Because that'll knock you out the game. That spirit of offense is tough. And you got to cut it off way back here because I've seen people get offended and they are not nice. And you could have done everything for them and one little offense skews everything. They don't see nothing that you've ever done, nothing that the church has ever done. All they see is one thing. It's demonic. I had to learn that when, you know, sometimes I would say to Leslie, but Leslie and I personally had, have given someone like $1,400, $1,500, just personally out of our account. And a fence hits them down the line, and there's no gratitude. No one else is, they didn't have nobody to give them, we, we helped them out. And I'm not saying that to feel sorry for us because we're good. I'm just saying, don't cut down the lines of communication. Don't say always or never. Try to find a better way. You say, well, what's the better way? I don't know. Ask the Holy Spirit. He'll tell you. Maybe we need to start praying before we speak to people. Look at Colossians 3, verse 21. This is New Living Translation. Colossians 3.21. Now these messages, this is like maybe th two, three weeks now on Wednesday nights that I've preached along this line. I'm following the Holy Spirit. I hope nobody thinks I'm picking on them. Because I'm, I'm too sensitive. But the older I get, the... Uh, because I'm not thinking of any one person or any certain situation. Um, in the beginning, this was tough because everybody likes to be liked. And my, I want to maybe stand up here every service and tell you what you, what you can get by faith and, and all the blessings that belong to you. And, and we need those messages, but sometimes we need messages like this. And if the Holy Spirit leads me on it, then I'm going to stay on it. I know I'm preaching to myself. I'm always trying to be a better husband. I'll just be transparent. Can I be transparent? I'm always trying to be a better husband. And so I'm speaking to myself. I remember one time Oral Roberts was on a, um, a TV show and his wife was sitting next to him and he's, he's answering a question and his wife butts in and she never talked much. But she wanted to interject and he got a little snappy with her on TV. I'm like, whoa. And he stopped it about, about, he stopped his, he went on to speak, but he stopped it about 10 seconds later and he said, excuse me. He said, I forgot who I was talking to. And he turned to his wife and said, what do you, what do you want to say, honey? He forgot who he was talking to. Don't forget who you're talking to. If it's your wife or your husband, in this case, your children. Or your brother or your sister in church. Or your boss at work. There should be no spouting off to your boss at work. None. None. Because the Bible says you're to work for your employers if you're working for the Lord. Would you spout off to the Lord? Why'd you get me started on that one? Look at Colossians 3.21. New Living Translations. Fathers, do not aggravate your children or they will become discouraged. Now we know that they could be mothers too. Parents, we can say, right? 
Do not aggravate your children or they will become discouraged. I like what the Amplified Bible says. It says, do not provoke or irritate or exasperate your children with demands that are trivial or unreasonable or humiliating or abusive. Treat them tenderly with loving kindness so they will not lose heart and become unmotivated with their spirits broken. You can break your, your children's spirit if you don't treat them with respect. Amen? We need a strong spirit because the Bible says a strong spirit of a man or a woman will sustain them in time of trouble, but a wounded spirit who can bear? There is a tremendous responsibility parenting children. And with that tremendous responsibility, God gives you a tremendous ability. You have the ability. You're the numero uno covering over your children. The church isn't. We, we, we support you. Amen? But with that tremendous responsibility comes a tremendous ability. Then there's a tremendous accountability. We're accountable. Sometimes I think parents try to argue with their children on like an adult level. They're not adults. They're children. And their minds don't work like adults. And trust me, we want to be very, we choose our words carefully with our children or grandchildren or whatever. Grandchildren, you know, they say grandchildren is even better than children. I like grandchildren. <laughs> Love my children. But the grandchildren, they go home, you know, at the end of the day. <laughs> but the grandchildren, you know, you get older. And you get wiser. And you start, like, looking at the trees when you never looked at trees before. <laughs> or birds. You just, everything just slows down. You're not so fast-paced. You don't have all that responsibility. I mean, hopefully not all that pressure. And you can just, you can just be the, the wise one. Or the one that interjects some good good things or something, right? And uh, you can, uh, I know a lot of uh, um, adult kids said, say to their parents, why didn't you treat me like, like you treat my kids? Well, it's because you get older and you get wiser and, and you think about things a little bit more, right? But there is an accountability, isn't there? I know uh, a man who um, said that he was, uh, he was uh, hard to live with in the home. Don't be that one if you can help it. Don't be the person in the home that's hard to talk to. Don't be the one that's hard to talk to. And uh, this guy, his family felt like they had to walk on eggshells around him. And um, he went to see his pastor with an open heart. And the pastor said, I want you to read 1 Corinthians 13, a love chapter. I want you to read it every day, three times a day. And he did that for about three months and then meditated on it three times a day. Took it like a medicine, right? God's word is God's medicine. Yes. And, and he was completely delivered. He became so nice to his whole family. And I have a copy of... Uh, Back there, some coffee, copies on the uh, table if you want to get one later. It's 1 Corinthians 13. Um, I think it's 4 through 7 or 8. My daughter Leah did this. She entitled it, entitled it I Am Love. And um, she put I in there for, for, for when, when we read it, we put ourselves in there. And it goes like this I am patient. I am kind. I am not jealous. I am not proud. I am not rude. I am not demanding my own way. I am not irritable. I keep no record of being wronged. I do not rejoice about injustice. I do rejoice in truth. I never give up. I never lose faith. I am always hopeful. I endure through everything in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. 
We got copies back there. Leslie and I have one of these taped in our bedroom, in her office, a spare bedroom. And we try to read it when we can. God's word is God's, med- God's medicine. Three times a day. The good thing about this, good things about these phones nowadays, you can, you can take a picture of it. And then if you're at work, you can pull it up on your phone, if that's how you want to do it. Because if you carry the paper around, it might get old and wrinkly after a while, but that's all right, I'll get you another one. But we need to get serious about allowing the Word to shape our minds and to change the way that we think. Turn in your Bibles to Ephesians 4.29. This is New Living Translation. And in Ephesians, Paul's talking about their relationship in the church, their interreactions with one another. And while you're turning there, I want to I say this, that nearly everyone that comes into this church, the first thing they say, if it's their first time coming in, they feel the love. They feel the love in here. And you know, after you're here and you're gone, the presence of God still lingers and stays in here. Sometimes during the middle of the week, I'll walk in here and just sit on those rocking chairs and I'll feel the presence of God already here. That comes from you. Amen? You don't get there by accident. You get there by being kind and loving and patient with people and loving one another and loving God. And uh, one day I was sitting in my office working and, and uh, somebody stopped by. They don't, go to, they, they don't go to the church or anything. They stopped by to ask a question or something. And when they, as soon as they walked in the door... You know what they said? Man, I feel the presence of God in here. It was like a Thursday. (laughs) And that was the highest compliment. There was an old Methodist preacher that came in here. He was a Methodist preacher for 40 years. He gave us the highest compliment. He said, when I came in here, I felt the love of God. He said, but you preach 45 minutes? And if I tried to preach 45 minutes in my church, they'd hang me up at a, by a tree or something, he said. Some churches don't, don't want a lot of uh, preaching. Well, we're not the place for you then, because we like to preach. Look at Ephesians 4.29. New Living Translation. Do not use foul or abusive language. There's a, let me just stop there for a minute. I can't help that one. One of the most disheartening things is when I hear a believer cursing. If you ain't got that under control, you got to get that under control. Amen? Because blessing and cursing are not to come from the same fountain, and you got the fountain of the Holy Spirit inside of you. I know the world likes to curse. That's what they do, but they're the world. That's not you. So don't use foul or abusive language. Abusive language. Let everything you say be good and helpful so that your words will be an encouragement to those who hear them. And do not bring sorrow to God's Holy Spirit by the way you live. Remember, He has identified you as His own guaranteeing that you will be saved on a day of redemption. The Holy Spirit lives in you. And you can grieve Him. You can grieve the Holy Spirit. You can bring Him sorrow. Do you want to bring the Holy Spirit sorrow? I don't. This word grieve or or sorrow means that there's a close relationship there. It doesn't mean, if you study this out, it doesn't mean like, say like if I go down the the sheets and somebody down there calls me a name and does something, says something terrible to me, might irritate me a little bit and, or whatever, but it's not going to ruin my day. But if me and my wife would have words and she would say something that's not so nice, which she would never do. It would, it would hurt me. 
This is the kind of relationship that this is talking about. Happy birthday, by the way. Tomorrow's Leslie's birthday. Can't tell them how old you are. You don't care. 53. <coughs> she caught up to me. <laughs> 50s ain't so bad. Okay. <laughs> but we don't want to sorrow the Holy Spirit, do we? Now, is this just my opinion standing up here, or is this is what the Word says? I care about grieving the Holy Spirit. You know why? He is my best friend. He is my best friend. Growing up, I didn't have a whole lot of friends because I was too quiet, too reserved. If you wanted to be my friend, you had to work real hard at it. That's how Leslie became my wife. She had to work real hard at it. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, um, but I'll tell you one thing the Holy Spirit has always been my friend always amen and I'd like to not grieve him with my behavior or the words that I say look at 31 get rid of all bitterness rage, anger harsh words and slander as well as all types of evil behavior now, this is a New Living Translation, but it uses the word, get rid of it. Sort of like you're, you're like uh, throwing out the garbage. Get rid of it. I told you to get rid of it. Didn't tell me to get, me to get rid of your stuff. You got to get rid of your stuff. I get rid of my stuff. Right? How can I be dealing with your stuff when I got my stuff? Look at verse 32. Instead, be kind to each other, tender hearted, forgiving one another, just as God through Christ has forgiven you. The Amplified Bible says, be compassionate, understanding, forgiving of one another, readily and freely, just as God in Christ also forgave you. You've got to be ready and free with your forgiveness. I'll never forget uh, one day uh, I was talking to a husband and, and his wife. They're in the church, and um, their child was friends with another child in the church. And I don't know, something might have happened. I don't know what quite happened, but the mother of the other child was calling the mother that I was standing beside. And, and, um, and I don't think she meant to, to explain it that way, but she sort of made it sound like um, this mother's child was the whole problem. And was sort of like uh, um, criticizing. You gotta be careful how you talk about some people's children because they don't like that. And uh, um, I was watching this woman's reaction because the whole time I knew this conversation was going on, I'm thinking, oh boy, is this one of my tasks tomorrow? Am I have a new fire to put out? Am I going to need to go and say, come on, can't we just get along? Come on, she didn't mean it. Come on. But I didn't have to. Because this woman, offense, an offense hit her. And she said, she hung up the phone, she said, I could get offended, but I'm not. She got rid of it. Took out the trash. We can do the same thing, can't we? We can do it. Watch your words. Be uplifting. Make sure that your spouse isn't the one that, that's hearing all the, all, everything that you go through, all your negativity. Check with the Lord about that because sometimes they don't need to hear it all either. I'm not saying don't talk about things, but... Um, we got to start watching our words and start, stop speaking the negativity and problems so much, too. There's a, there's a middle of the road, right? Now, pastor's not saying, don't ever talk to your husband about anything or your wife. I'm not saying that. I'm not saying that. Check the tape. I did not say that. <laughs> I'm saying, are you dumping too much in there? I remember uh, Joyce Myers said that when she first learned how to be a preacher or teacher... 
She was, I mean, she was doing good. But there was three ladies in the church that had an issue with her. And, uh, um, because she didn't look the part. And uh, it would just bother her. And she would go home and just lay it all out on Dave. Good old Dave. Just lay it all out. Do you know what she said? And you know, she said this. And then later, she said that. And Dave's like, poor guy probably didn't get no sleep. But the Lord was training her, developing her to be a worldwide teacher. He's training all of us to do something that's just as special. And the Lord said, I want you to stop talking so much about how them people are treating you. And she's thinking, okay. And then the Lord said, don't even say it to Dave. And so that night, oh my goodness, she, she's like, she wanted to say it so bad, she had to put her hand over her mouth like, <clears throat> she just wanted to tell Dave. Well, she got to handle all that. Amen. Be careful how you speak about the church with your children around. Amen. Because we are to be teaching our children to love this place, to honor this place, to reverence this place. Be careful. I know sometimes we need to have adult conversations, and sometimes there are constructive criticisms. I understand that because I'm not saying we do everything right, but your children don't need to hear it. Too many parents, they, don't, they have these conversations, and the kid's sitting right there. And they got little rabbit ears. And you think they're playing on their phone, but they're like. <laughs> little rabbit ears peek up there. It just comes against the, the, um, what we're supposed to be doing. We're, supp we're supposed to be teaching them reverence. Showing them love and showing them kindness. Showing them how to, how to um, behave in the church. Because they're going to replicate what we do. Amen? That's all I have. Would you rise, please? So we'll see what we get for next week. I'm ready to move on. Let's hope the Holy Spirit hit. I'll do what he tells me to do. Amen. But thank you for coming. Thank you for being a part of what the church is doing. I like everybody sitting up front like that. I can see your faces. I don't have to have my glasses on. <laughs> Let's pray. Father, thank you for this uh, message. Thank you, Lord, for these wonderful people, Lord. They're, they're kind. They're loving. They're supportive. Lord, they, they, they come here and they, 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 um, they just don't quit. They come and they support and they do everything that you've asked them to do, Lord. And I thank you, Lord, that you're going to make something out of us, Lord, together that we could never do on our own, Lord. Because this church is bigger than us on a personal level. This church is, 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 is the kingdom of God. And I thank you for that. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.